welcome to the Dribble Podcast, your home for basketball in WA, with an inside look at both the Perth Wildcats and Perth Lynx throughout the 2021-22 seasons. My name is Craig O'Donoghue from the West Australian newspaper, and throughout the year I'll be joined by a host of guests to provide you with as much insight and entertainment as your basketball brain can handle. The NBL season begins on Friday night with the new look Perth Wildcats hosting the Adelaide 36ers at RAC Arena at 6.30pm. It's been just over five months since the Wildcats were swept by Melbourne United for the NBL Championship and hasn't it been a tumultuous off-season for them? Just five days after the grand final, Sports Entertainment Group bought the Wildcats from Jack Bendat. The ink wasn't even dry on that contract and the handover hadn't even been completed when five-time championship coach Trevor Gleeson accepted an offer to become an assistant coach at the Toronto Raptors, sending the Wildcats into a spin as they began searching for a new leader. Throughout what was a busy month, John Mooney signed to play in Japan, assistant coach Jacob Chance moved to the Tasmania Jack Jumpers, and he was joined there by Clint Steindl, Will Magne and Jared Bairstow. But... Perth started making a host of changes of their own, including a new coach, Scott Morrison, and plenty of new players, such as ex-NBA players Vic Law and Michael Frazier II. One man had his fingerprints on all of this, and he too was a new face to the club. His name is Danny Mills, a Perth native who most recently worked as the Director of Scouting at the Philadelphia 76ers in the NBA, and I'm pleased to say he is in the studio with me here today. Danny, welcome to the Dribble Podcast. Yeah, thanks Craig, thanks for having me. Um, Yeah, big off-season for the club, personally for myself. Um, Yeah, it's been about 18 years since I was left Perth, and I've come back full circle, and now uh, in this position with the Wildcats, which I'm thrilled to be in. So... You've had an amazing basketball journey, played juniors at Wanneroo and Willerton, represented WA eight times, played juniors for Australia, an AIS scholarship holder, had a stint at the Wildcats as a training squad member, and played at Oregon Tech in America. Then you spent 12 years working in Europe and America before this big role at the 76ers. So why move back to Perth? Yeah, um, I think there were a number of reasons. I think obviously it's Perth and it's the Wildcats, so every time a club like that... uh, I guess considers you for a position I think you have to listen um, Two I think I was ready For a change To take on more Of a leadership role Like working in the M- in the NBA For seven years Was exciting And I grew a lot um, And obviously You're at the highest level And um, working with You know Sam Hinkey Brett Brown Daryl Morey These these types of basketball minds I mean you're learning Something every day um, But for me When SEN came in And, and, and bought the Wildcats um, The CEO Troy Georgie Who we, we've created a really good friendship over the last couple of years he came reaching back out thinking there could be an opportunity to come in into this GM of basketball role and he got me across uh, Richard Simkus and Chris Tan and Craig Hutchinson who were the new owners and um, we had some really uh, good 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 discussions and I was very intrigued by the role and then uh, obviously the I think the the ability to one move back to Perth with I got a young family uh, three young kids um, and two just put your imprints on a club like Perth that's had so much success, but I feel like can do so much more as well. So I think that opportunity with everything else going on was just too good to pass up and we came to an agreement and um, three months later, we're finally finally in Perth. It was uh, three months of working on Zoom and on calls and you know the first order of business was trying to replace Trevor Gleeson, which is no easy feat. I mean, the success he had is unprecedented in the NBL in terms of that period of time, five championships in seven years, and to go find the next leader of the team uh, was an extensive process, but one for myself that's trying to grow into a role as a general manager was incredible. Like I got to sit with ownership and Troy and go through 16 different candidates that we interviewed for a first round and then narrow it down. And once we narrowed it down to a few and Scott being one of them, I think we all felt very comfortable. Um, with him coming on board as our, as our new head coach, and I don't think we could be happier with what we've seen so far. So talk to us about Scott specifically. Yeah. Like You had, as you said, 16, so a lot of talented people put their hands up for it. What made him stand out from the pack? Yeah, so a lot of things. I think initially I have, I've had had a previous relationship with Scott about eight years ago. We were in the NBA G League together, um, and I've seen his career go from a G League intern uh, eight years ago to being the head coach of the main Red Claws for three years, which is an incredible jump just in itself and being a head coach uh, coach of the year in the G League to being four years on the on the bench with the Boston Celtics and to Brad Stevens as one of his top assistants. Um, 
and, you know, getting to two Eastern Conference finals. So his experience in that just speaks for itself. And then the other part of it that made us feel really comfortable was coming from Canada. He'd coach at the collegiate level in Canada for 13 years as a head coach. So it wasn't an assistant that's making the step for the first time. He'd had head coaching experience there for 13 years, took the sabbatical to do the intern year at Maine, had three years as a head coach in the G League, winning coach of the year one year, and then four years as an assistant in the NBA, plus his Canada basketball national team experience, both junior and senior. He ticked every box we were looking for. Um, And then just the person he is, the humility he comes with. um, And he was excited. Like he, He wanted the job. He wanted to be a head coach again, and he felt that the Perth Wildcats was the perfect opportunity for him to do that. And for us, it was he ticked boxes quickly. We quickly got to the second round, and then you know we got into negotiations. And for me, couldn't couldn't be more thrilled to bring Scott into Perth and and already seeing what he's doing with the group and how comfortable the group is around him. Even it's only been two weeks since he's been actually physically on the ground. It's been incredible. So, so I've, one of the parts I found fascinating was that Trevor Gleeson was responsible for signing players when he was the coach. You're signing the players now, and he's just said. I'll coach you, just give me players. Yeah. But you were signing players before you had a coach. So were you looking for someone who could fit the playing group that you had from a style perspective or were you thinking, well, he'll, he'll be able to coach regardless of what type of player I have? Yeah, I think, I think the latter. Um, obviously, we signed Vic before we signed Scott. Um, Vic was our first signing. Obviously, getting that second American next to Bryce, American next to Bryce was important uh, and getting that right. Um, and yeah, I mean, coming from where I've been in the NBA for the last seven years, uh, it is quite a, there is a separation between the front office and the coaching staff and the coaching staff is day to day and they focus on the shorter term lens. I mean, their, their jobs depend on day to day success and season success where the front office is looking for the longevity of the club, looking through a longer lens, um, signing players on longer term deals where that coach might not be coaching them in two years, but that's good for the club. So In terms of that, that was our vision um, with ownership, with Troy, and um, that's kind of how we've set up the structure. I think it's unique maybe for an NBL team to be set up like this, but I think it brings us many advantages, and I think you'll see that the rest of the NBL will probably follow suit. I think that's the way the league should grow. That's my opinion, but um, coming from the NBA, I've seen how it's worked, and to have... um, uh, the head coach control the roster as well. I think you can get a little murky. So having another voice in there in a front office role, I think can really help. And I think we've seen it this year. And it's not just myself making decisions. It's a group decision. Clearly, Scott's a big part of that. When we're signing players, we're getting his opinion and he's bringing us players as well for us to consider. But we're considering a lot of different things. And yeah, we have a general manager of basketball. We have a head coach and we kind of go from there. And we're going to continue to grow the, the front office that way. So let's imagine that I'm a lot taller and a lot younger than what I am at the moment. What If you're a young basketballer out there at the moment and you're looking to be noticed, you've been noticing players around the world for years. What What is it about a specific skill set, a type of character, a type of athlete that, that makes you go, that guy could be something? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I think first off, physical attributes, and this is coming from an NBA lens, and I guess now from from an NBA lens, like when you see young players, you're looking for, obviously positional size helps. You know, once you get to that professional level, there's size does get you an advantage. And in saying size, it's not just height, it's wingspan. So having a plus wingspan is a, is a big physical attribute. Athleticism is huge. You know, it's such an athletic game. You're, you're transitioning both ways. You're playing offense and defense. Um, and so those sort of things are important, um, quickness, foot speed, um, agility. So all of those things come into play. So you can notice right away just from how a player moves physically that, you know, they've, they're, they're a different sort of athlete. They're in a different category than maybe this person. And obviously depending on how, if you're looking at a 12 year old compared to an 18 year old, it's very different because there's the the development growth is, is huge. They still got six, seven more years to go. But when you're evaluating guys for the pros, like, yeah, definitely physical characteristics and then the skill side. Um, and, and basketball as a game is changing quickly. Uh, I think you've seen it through the NBA going to a very spaced out, five out, everyone can shoot. You know, for us, it's about versatility and the NBA has gone that way and the NBL is and FIBA basketball is trending that way where every player can shoot, pass and dribble. And they're very skilled where back in the day, you probably had three perimeter guys, two big guys. The spacing wasn't um, all as conducive to playing on a smaller fever court as opposed to an NBA court. And so 
I think skill now is, 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 it always has been, but even more important. So guys that have a good feel and IQ and kind of read the game and have that uh, natural um, ability just to, to, kind of, to kind of play the game the way it should be played. And so there's a lot of attributes to it, but initially as, as a young kid, I mean, I was in the shoes, if you're talking about an under 16 kid playing for Willerton or Wanneroo and trying to make a state team, it's skill, but also what talent value is going to look at is, is their physical attributes and, and what's their growth trajectory, like how much bigger they're going to get, you know, because there's kids that develop at a later age and there's guys like myself, I was 15 in the same size as I am now and I never grew and everyone caught up. And so my career probably stopped earlier than I would have liked. But um, yeah, I, th- I think there's many attributes, but definitely the physical side of it and then, and then the skill acquisition side. What did you like about Vic and what did you like about Michael Frazier to bring those guys into this program? Yeah, so firstly with Vic, uh, obviously had some familiarity with him, watching him in college at Northwestern. Uh, didn't get drafted, but was a two-way player with Orlando and got called up to a few games there and then watching him last year with the Brisbane Bullets. So we followed him as the Philadelphia 76ers. He was a guy that internationally we followed um, and was awesome. Rookie year in the NBL, he took it by storm. I think he averaged 19 and close to 10 rebounds a game. And so for a young guy coming into the NBL, that's that's impressive. Um, and so when I got this job, I went through obviously all of the rosters from last year and looking at the top imports. And he was someone that, I wouldn't say people forgot about, but he didn't finish the season. He got injured. And so he, we quickly turned to our attention to him to see what he was doing now, where he was with his injury. He was playing for the Lakers in Summer League, played really well, which actually to me, I thought we wouldn't have had a chance. I thought one, he was either going to get a training camp deal or a two-way and stay in the NBA or get picked up in Europe. And when we started negotiating with his agent, there seemed to be legitimate interest to come back to Australia. And I think when he knew it was Perth and he talked about this himself, that you know he feels like Perth was the gold standard and he wanted to be a part of it. And so for us, we were extremely excited. We could, we could get him across the line early. And so once we'd had Bryce in place and Vic, we felt very comfortable that we didn't have to rush the third import. Obviously, we didn't with Michael. We waited. We wanted to get through training camp in the NBA and see what our options could be. And when Michael became available, uh, he was considering numerous options overseas. Um, he's been with USA Basketball extensively from their junior national team when he won a gold medal in 2013 uh, with Billy Donovan, who's now the head coach of the Bulls, who was his college coach at Florida. And he's been with their USA FIBA qualifying team, so kind of the USA B team. But the fact that he's been in that USA basketball program for that long speaks volumes about him as a player, but also him as a person, because they can choose thousands of people to represent them. And he's one of those 12 on that, that team that qualifies, that got USA qualified to Tokyo. So, um, And I'd, I'd followed him extensively in the G League. Um, obviously, he came out of college, went to a Final Four of Florida, and then watching him in the G League, he had a, um, you know, a short stint with the Houston Rockets, um, played with their G League team, won a G League title with them, um, and actually played with our Philadelphia uh, G League affiliate last year in Delaware. And so got to know, didn't know him, but across our staff, there was very positive remarks about Michael, who he was as a person, but also how effective he was on the court as a player. And so when I started talking to his agent and the fact that he was interested in coming to Australia if, as an overseas off, uh, option uh, and the fact that Perth and – you know, his agent had Casey Prather here, same same agent. Obviously, they were teammates at Florida. I think it all kind of um, – that was a quick negotiation and they were quick, ready to commit and we were we were really excited to bring him into the fold. So, you got the, obviously, Bryce being your third import, extremely handy third import, yeah. but we all know that the debate around his citizenship and where that, that sits, it's in a unique situation at the moment in that the Australian Boomers will be playing again in February – and the NBA players won't be available, so they might want to get him in for those for those matches. Do you know whether Basketball Australia is going to push heavily again to try to get him naturalised in time for that window? Yeah, there's ongoing discussions. Obviously, as I've kind of got into this role, I've been brought into them. Um, I think the time frame is what it is right now. I don't think there's any real um, date set. We just don't know. It's up to the Australian government, honestly. Um in saying that, that's an exciting proposition when Bryce does become an extreme season, one for him, but also two for the club. Um, in terms of the FIBA qualifying window in February, I, because the NBL isn't going to have a break for the FIBA window, um, someone like Bryce won't be available for that window. It'll be more of a younger group, I would imagine. So um, how that plays out, I'm not sure. But for sure, for future um, teams, I think, yeah, I mean, I think you'd be, you'd be silly not to uh, at least consider bringing someone like Bryce Cotton. I mean, he's clearly just an elite talent in the NBL and has been for the last five years and is already probably one of the best 
players who ever play in the league after five years. So, and he's just coming into his prime now. So, I think we're we're all very, um, we should all be very fortunate to be watching Bryce in Wildcats colours, and we hope he's here for many more years to come. And um, you know, building a team around a talent like that, very fortunate position that Scott and I are coming into. You know, it's not often you get to walk into a team that's already set up like Perth has been for the last 10, 20 years, and get to try and carry it on. With that comes a lot of pressure. We understand that there's expectations with the Wildcats and that's championships every year. And so that's our goal, but also um, it's been made easier by having a Bryce Cotton, a Jesse Wagstaff, a Mitch Norton, you know, um, Todd Blanchfield, all of these guys that have already been here and created this culture. That's just kind of, um, it kind of polices itself. The guys are unbelievably um, professional. It's the best, culture I've seen as, as a club and it's talked about a lot in the community I think and the NBL and everyone kind of looks at the Wildcats as the gold standard as they should and it really is like coming into it I've only been with the team for two weeks but everything from the office staff to Troy who runs the business side to um, ownership group and then the playing and the, and the staff our medical staff Josh and Dan are unbelievable um, yeah I mean it is it's really an exciting time to be part of the, the club and trying to get it to a new level Let's talk about that medical staff because they've got a fair, fair bit of work going on. Now, we're doing this at one twenty-five on Tuesday, just in case anything changes from this perspective um, with your players. But Mitch Norton's been ruled out for first uh, five rounds of the season. Todd Blanchfield is working his way back from a knee. Corey Sherville working his way back from a foot. And Michael Frazier and Jack Purchase missed pre-season games. How confident are you about the situation with your squad heading into round one from an injury standpoint? Yeah, it's not ideal. I mean, coming into it, you would hope everyone's uh, healthy and ready for game one, but that's the that's reality at the moment. Um, but the thing I love about our squad is we're really deep at every position, and I think we, we'll be able to cover as, as much as you can cover for a Mitch Norton or a Todd Blanchfield being out. I think we've got the pieces that can. Um, but in, a, in in an ideal world, yeah, you want Mitch out there every game and Todd out there, but it's – well, usually it's October, but it's December. We're starting. We're looking towards April and May. You know, that's that's when we want guys to be healthy. And so do we want to be behind the eight ball first five games of the season at home? No, we want to come out. We have to win all of these. We have to set ourselves up. But we're not going to do that at the jeopardizing a player's health. And so I think coming into this role, understanding Josh Kavanagh and Dan Webster, our medical team, and obviously our doctors that – um, player health is up most and first and foremost and if they're not ready and they don't think they're ready um, we're not going to push them um, and so that's where we're at uh, I think you'll see Todd Blanchfield and Corey Sherville are very close really close um, so that's exciting um, don't have a date on it but it's 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 definitely coming uh, Mitch obviously we announced yesterday will be out for the first five games which is Disappointing, but again, we're taking a long, long lens view on it, and there's no point rushing Mitch back. Uh, you know, he's going to be fine. Um, take, take a, take an approach when you know we leave for Adelaide on April, sorry, December 27th to hit the road. Um, he's going to be ready. That's the, that's the plan, and um, yeah, just going from there. And you know, it, it gives other guys chances to step up. You know, you saw young Mitchell Clark come to Tasmania with us. Uh, unbelievable, like his story, and you know, he's put in so much work over the last two years. I haven't been here, obviously, but listening to some of our assistants, uh, Luke Brennan, Keegan Crawford, just continuously bring his name up as a player we should be considering to get him into the group in Tasmania and to see those last two games when he came in and just looked very composed, made shots, looked like he belonged, you know, in an NBL game, which is awesome for a young WA kid. That's what we're about. We're trying to grow Perth, Western Australia born players and keep that tradition going within the Wildcats and. You know, Luke Travis is, is another one we haven't talked about. I mean, uh, he's starting for the Perth Wildcats at 20 years old and playing an important role um, in our preseason um, campaign over there in Tasmania. And we're expecting big things from Luke, and I know he's expecting big things from himself. But from what we've seen so far, we're really, really impressed. So you mentioned Luke Travis there. So what's he going to become? He wants to be an NBA player, clearly. Do, do you see him having the talent, uh, the athletic attributes, all that sort of stuff to be able to make it? Yeah, for sure. I think Luke's a incredibly talented player, <clears throat> bigger than I thought. I'd seen him a couple of years ago in person, um, but getting up close around him now, seeing him at practice and in games in the blitz, like legit six eight, big wingspan, about six eleven, seven foot wingspan. Um, his frame clearly isn't developed yet, and he's still growing. And I think that's exciting to see how he's physically going to mature, and that's only going to help his game on the court, especially as he gets to higher levels, whether it's the NBL, the Australian Boomers. 
obviously the, the NBA is a goal of his and a goal of ours for him. Like that's what he should be shooting for. He's got all the talent in the world. It's kind of uh, up to him. You know, it's, it's up to Luke to put the work in uh, day to day and understand what it takes to get to that next level. I mean, when you talk about the NBA, there's 450 guys in the world that play in the NBA every year. And you talk about the thousands of teams, let alone players professionally around the world that play and want to get to that same level. So you're talking about the elite of the elite and Luke has all the physical attributes. I think he has the feel and basketball IQ to get there. Uh, it's just a matter of it all coming together and not not rushing the process. He doesn't need to to, to, to speed himself up. He just needs to trust the process, I guess, is a, is a phrase that's been used and um, just kind of buy into this situation he's in now. And obviously, um, credit to the previous staff, especially Trevor and those guys bringing him in as a young junior. He's a fantastic young prospect and we want to be all about bringing in young West Australian talent and keeping them in Perth, not letting them go overseas or across interstate and keeping them in Wildcats colours. Um, and so for us, for Luke, yeah, we're, we're all invested in trying to have him reach his potential, which we think is the NBA, whether he reaches it. Again, like we said, that's, that's kind of up to him and, and he's got – We've sat him down and he's got all the resources in the world. He's got a head coach that's coaching the NBA for four years. So that he understands what it takes. He was director of play development for the Boston Celtics, working with Gordon Hayward, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown every day. Luke has that at his doorstep every single day, door open. So he takes advantage of that. He's got a GM of basketball that's been a talent evaluator in the NBA for the last seven years. So sitting him down and being like, Luke, when you get to this stage and you're going to pre-draft camps and – pre-draft workouts with NBA teams. This is what teams from the inside want to look at from you. This is what they're going to ask you in interviews. Prep him for those things and give him the best chance possible to uh, to get across that. So um, excited for him. Uh, obviously, his focus hopefully is just on this season. We don't want him to look too for- forward ahead, but there's always going to be the, the, um, the hype around him as there should be about the NBA, but hopefully he can focus on the day-to-day and winning with the Wildcats and that will take care of itself. If you win, that's only going to help you as an individual as well. So, but yeah, Luke's been fantastic. Um, really excited with his progress already, and even more excited about what we can see in the next year. It is a monumental advantage for him, isn't it? Having yourself and Scott with the NBA background sitting there every single day talking him through the things he wouldn't know because he's you don't know what you don't know. One hundred percent. And then the other part of it is he has an agent, Daniel Moldovan, who has Josh Giddy and had Aaron Baines and these kind of guys in the NBA. So he's got a lot of experience around him. Um, and like I said, it, it's up to him. It's up to him now to absorb all of that and, and take it in. And um, the world's his oyster at the moment. Like it's it's really, you know, he can be as good as he wants to be. And um, I think he's got all the potential in the world. But, yeah, he's, he's got all the resources around him. He couldn't ask for a better situation. He's at home in Perth playing for his hometown team. And he's got this NBA ecosystem around him now in his home city. Like, you know, it's up to him. We all look back and go, how's Bryce Cotton still in Perth and not playing in NBA? Can you provide some insight into why he was consistently overlooked by teams for when he was in such good form over here for so many years? Um, yeah, I mean, that's probably a question for Bryce. Like, I mean, Bryce is good enough playing the NBA. He's an NBA player. He's an NBA talent. Offensively, he's clearly an NBA talent. And he's had, you know, a cup of tea in the league. And he's played EuroLeague with Anadolu Efes. That was the team in Istanbul before he came to Perth. And I think there's a number of factors. I think one of them um, is he's comfortable here. He's obviously settled. He's got a wife and a child. And um, I think, yeah, I think that's a beauty. And that's the advantage of having myself coming into this role in Perth is it recruits itself. I mean, it's the Perth Wildcats. It's the gold standard of the NBL. We're trying to continue on that. But it's also the city, the history of the club, what's come before us. Um, and it was part of our recruiting. Sorry, I'm going off track here a little bit. But every time we spoke to players this year, like selling them on Perth was easy. They knew about Perth. They wanted to be here. It's about us selling the new structure and Scott and myself and the club. And um, it was easy to sell them on Perth. And so I think for Bryce, he's he's lived it. He's breathed it. He's been there for five years. He's had incredible, unprecedented success, you could probably call it. Um, five years, three titles, three MVPs. Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, outside of the NBA, there's the Euro League, and then there's a lot of other leagues, but there's not many situations like Perth that have the city, the lifestyle, the Australian culture, uh, summer, um, safe to live with your family, uh, all these sort of things add up, and I think Bryce values that. 
maybe some other Americans wanted to take a chance on getting back to the league and their hero fringe. I think I think Bryce is very comfortable where he's at, where he's at in his career. He loves the city of Perth. I think he loves the club. Um, and yeah, we're really excited about obviously this season and then you know into the future. We, we want Bryce to be a, a Wildcat forever. So that's our plan. How do you see the, the combination of him with Vic and Michael Fraser um, to playing together in, in terms of how they work it out with the three imports this year? Obviously, there was only two last year. He's never played with these guys before. Yeah. How do you see that combination working? Yeah, so far so good. Um, obviously, with Vic, we, we we wanted to address having a, a, a secondary playmaker on the floor that could kind of help close games with Bryce. I think what you'll see, <clears throat> what a lot of teams do, and rightfully show, so given how dominant Bryce is on the ball, they try and blitz him, they'll trap him, get the ball out of his hands. So having him, having the ability for him to get it to another player that can then make plays out of that, playing downhill four and three, three on two advantage situations. So... Um, I think that's something that we wanted to address and getting Vic Law, we did that exactly. Um, and then with Michael, I think he complements both Vic and Bryce exceptionally well. He's, uh, he's a stronger athlete. He's obviously got a stronger build, defensive-minded guard that can make shots and can create off the dribble. Um, and so those are the things you want. You know, he's going he's gonna to make threes. Teams are going to adjust. They're going to run him off the line. And then he can get downhill and then he can make plays from there, whether it's himself finishing or finding the simple pass. So... Um, from what I've seen, obviously we haven't seen a lot of Michael yet on the court. Well, the fans haven't, but we've seen him in practice. And from everything I've seen and from everything talking with the coaching staff and also the players themselves, like I think it's a really good combination. Uh, the chemistry has been good so far. Off the court, those guys are getting along really well. Um, so, so far, so good. In terms of your height in, in your roster, it's really interesting when you look at the rest of the, the league. There are some genuine giants who are going to be running around. You're going to get Kai Soto as an opponent this week. He's 218 centimetres. Uh, Brisbane's Chu Wan Chin Lu is 225 centimetres. And there's a couple who are at 216. Your tallest player is Matt Hodgson at 211. Do you look at it and go, geez, we're going to have some issues with some of that height? Or are you confident that the way you'll play will make up for that? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think the way Scott and I view the game and kind of going back to that talent evaluation part, like more like versatility and skill as opposed to just having huge size. Um, but being live at the Blitz, it was eye-opening. Brisbane's huge. Adelaide's big. Big teams. Uh, like just in general, they got two or three seven-footers each, which is unique, I think, for today's game. But uh, gives them advantages. They can play small, they can play big. And so, yeah, we'll have to adjust at times and play a bit bigger with a bigger lineup. But I think on the other end, it gives us an advantage where we have so much versatility, teams are going to have to match up with us. So, yeah, it might be tough to play Big Lou from Brisbane. I can't pronounce his name like you did. That was pretty impressive. Um, like, yeah, how do we guard a 228 centimetre big? Well, you don't, you can't, you do your best, but how's he going to guard our guys on the other end? So that's, that's kind of the... You know, um, the chess match that we're, we're in, um, I believe in, in our versatility, I believe in, in all the guys that we've got. Obviously, landing Hodgson late in free agency was kind of the icing on the cake, kind of the big man we were looking for, especially as an Australian. And we're extremely excited about Matt and kind of how he's fit into the group already and he's just going to get so much better um, as, we, as we get more chemistry going. So, yeah, definitely not worried. Um, I, w I guess I would say I was. It was eye opening to see at the Blitz in Tassie how big some teams are, though in person. Um, maybe something, yeah. That's that that'll play out as the season goes along. But for us, I don't think there's any any worry about it. I think our overall size between all positions, you know, six five to six eight. I think that's going to play in good stead going forward. So was it a trend that you started to see building throughout? Like one team gets a big, someone really big, and the next team goes, we might have to match them. Or do you reckon that the teams went and just targeted players specifically and it was just ends up being the way it is rather than a targeted decision by every club to go really tall? That's a good question. Um, I think a lot of it becomes player availability. And I think someone like Big Lou, he's coming to Brisbane and he's a development player. Mm. Like he's not even on their actual roster, which is interesting. And obviously he's come from China and has experience with their national team. I think Adelaide, obviously, I won't speak for them, but it looks like they've, you know, they've signed a big roster. You know, they've, you've, you've had Isaac Humphries and Daniel Johnson, then you signed Kai Soto, and now you've got Cam Bears, though. So they've gone really big. Um, and then you've got other teams around the league that are probably playing more versatile. I think Sydney's one of them. I think New Zealand's one of them. So, um, yeah, I think every team has their own philosophy, the way they build their squad and what they value. Um, and I think clearly you can see what we value with our roster that we've built this year, but... 
yeah, I think it just makes for an exciting NBL season, to be honest. I mean, just being at the Blitz and seeing the other four teams that were there and then watching the, the group that was in Melbourne. I mean, such a competitive league. I mean, talking about only four teams making the playoffs, like it's, there's going to be some really good basketball teams that don't make the playoffs this year. Lots of changes to the season this year, and the NBL have implemented a coach's challenge as one of them. Coaches will get the chance to call a, fa- uh, a challenge when there's a foul or out-of-bounds call that they disagree with, but they must have a timeout to do so. We saw a glimpse of this in the NBL Blitz last year. Uh, sorry, the NBL Cup last year, but Trevor Gleeson never wanted to use it. He wanted to keep his timeouts. Here is what Scott Morrison said about the challenge when he was asked about it, given his experience with it in the NBA. It, help, it helps to save it, maybe, in case there's a key call down the stretch. You also don't want to risk losing a timeout for, you know, a, a shot in the dark at a challenge, because if you get the challenge wrong, you lose a timeout. Um, the other thing I would say is some calls, it's hard to tell even on video what's right, you know, especially, you know, out-of-bounds calls, you know, two guys hit the ball at the same time. Um, you never really know what the referee will decide. And in terms of fouls and things like that, There's always a gray area um, that they can point to if they want to reverse it or not reverse it. So it's never a sure thing. So you better be sure that you're going to win if you use it or you better want to take the time out anyway uh, because you're going to lose it if you lose the challenge. Do you agree with that? With your experience, it's it's difficult for anyone to really know when you're standing on the sidelines whether you're correct or not because no player ever thinks he's committed a foul. 100%. Um, No, 100%. Totally agree with what Scott just said. It's, yeah, it's tough because you don't want to waste it early uh, and you don't want to lose a timeout early either. So likely it's something you probably don't challenge until the second half and then you look at how the game's flowing and, you know, you, you want to keep a timeout up your sleeve or you want to keep a challenge up your sleeve for something that is probably more game-changing or game-altering at the end of or result-altering at the end of the game as opposed to using it in the first quarter because you felt the call was wrong. So I think you've seen that. It's been in the NBA now for a few years. Um, and our advantage to that is probably Scott's been in the NBA for the last few years. He's seen it. He's studied it. He's been around Brad Stevens with it. Those guys actually study those things and the front office is involved with when they think they should or they shouldn't use it and how they should use it and the risks involved and all of those sort of things. So, um, yeah, I mean, he's going to be smart. I, I know that with how and when. And uh, But it's cool. I'm glad the NBL is bringing that in. It's, it's, it's a fantastic rule. You've had oh, we've talked about your upbringing throughout the sport, and Scott's come from you know a, a really small island in Canada to work his way through to where he is. And there's gonna be a lot of people in WA who are dreaming of doing the same thing. And you're doing a wonderful thing on Wednesday night, where you are uh, providing local coaches the opportunity to sit down with with Scott and uh, with all the other coaches and learn from them. Talk us to about talk us through that and what an opportunity it is for the people in WA to have an NBA talent coach at their availability this week. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, definitely part of myself taking the job with the Wildcats and moving back home and um, just getting across, sharing knowledge and helping grow basketball in the state and also nationally. You know, basketball in Australia is booming. You've got the third best men's team in the world. Like, it's real. Like, it's it's not seventh or eighth. It's, you know, it's, it's a bronze medal Olympic winning team. And this is just the beginning, I think, of winning medals for basketball, which is Incredible when you think it's the second most popular sport in the world. If we're talking about soccer and the Socceroos are second in the world, the popularity around the sport here would be incredible. The Boomers are third in the world. So that I feel like that 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 should be able to something that can drive growth in the sport. And um, so coming back to Perth and being a part of that, the first thing was like, how can we get in the community more? How can we have better collaboration with Basketball WA? And how can we collaborate on things? And the first thing in my mind, and this is actually an idea that stemmed from watching Brett Brown at Philadelphia, was every year before the season, he would have a coach the coaches clinic and invite any local coach from the Philadelphia area, from Jersey, from Pennsylvania to come. And he would have a coaching clinic with him and his assistants for free. And yeah, have them, in, you know, get, get across some knowledge that he's learned and have them involved and have them feel connected to the team. And that's exactly what we want. And obviously the support in Perth is already there, but we want to be more open um, and I think, yeah, to start off the season um, two days before the opening game and have Scott Morrison, Mike Kelly, Luke Brennan come out and present a coaching clinic to any coach that wants to come um, in Western Australia or from wherever, if you wanted to travel, you, well, can't travel right now, but <laughs> um, from anywhere in Perth, I guess, um, come. And just today I was 
email, we've got 325 registered coaches. So um, super excited. It's at Willerton Basketball Stadium starting at 6 o'clock tomorrow. Um, but this is, you know, we, we labelled it first annual for a reason. It's going to be an annual event and this just won't be the only coaching clinic where we're going to get more in the community with these things. And um, yeah, open, like people want to talk basketball and career pathways and different things. Doors always open. So definitely very um, want to be very involved in the community in those things. Extraordinary opportunity. It'd be crazy not to get involved. If you've got the night off on, on Wednesday night, get down to Willerton and have a, have a chat to these guys and learn something. Um, there's plenty happening over here. I'm going to throw a curly one at you because you're from Philadelphia. Where's Ben Simmons band up? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I won't comment on it. It's, uh, it's a difficult situation. It's just the way it's dragged on. I don't think anyone could have thought it would drag on this long. It's, it's, it's kind of sad, to be honest. Um, I honestly have no idea. Um, it's, it's unprecedented waters, honestly, for the NBA and a player that's in his second year of his contract and is already trying to ask out for a trade. So it's, uh, you know, sometimes guys are in the third, mostly fourth or coming to the fifth year, they're looking for a move and, or they're guys that are older and just want to be on the winning team. But, uh, it's yeah, very different. Um, yeah, I won't comment on it, but, um, interesting situation that we'll see play out and obviously it's you know everyone in Australia is interested because it's Ben uh, as they should but it's uh, yeah interesting <laughs> you've, you've handled that one quite well <laughs> uh, so we have a segment on the Dribble podcast called This or That you get asked a question you have to make a decision what would you prefer out of this or that and this or that this week is the fixture normally it's Play home, play away, play home, play away, and you're back and forth mo- most weekends. You'll be starting the season with five games at home, and then you're away for an extended stint. If, in terms of an ideal world, what's better for players and teams, do you think? Staying at home for five weeks and then pl- going away for five weeks, or the traditional back and forth across the country? Um, oh, I think the back and forth. I think getting in the rhythm of a season, travelling every now and then, I think... I guess there's pros and cons. I'm probably not answering the question right here. Um, I mean, for us, right, if you're asking about what we have right now, the first five home games, this is incredible for us. Like, to have five home games to start the season at home, if we can take care of business, we're set, setting ourselves up. So for this season, I think we're in a really good spot in, in a normal non-COVID world, whether that's ever a reality. Um, I would say a normal regular back and forth season when you're traveling every second weekend. Uh, Brilliant. Well, thanks for coming in. Remember, everyone, 6 p.m. Wednesday, December the 1st at the Williton Basketball starting for the coaching clinic with Scott Morrison plus a meet and greet afterwards. And exclusive in this week's Sunday Times, make sure to grab your copy of the STM magazine. So you've got to go beyond the sporting pages. I know that a lot of sporting fans don't like doing that, but you've got to go to the STM magazine for our cover story on Wildcats coach Scott Morrison. He and his wife Suzanne spent a couple of hours on Sunday completing a photo shoot as we delve deeper into how a couple from a small island off the coast of Canada became the new coach and first lady of the Perth Wildcats. Danny Mills, thank you very much for coming in. Really appreciate your time. Good luck this season. Thanks, Craig. Appreciate all your support of the Cats. Now it's time to enter the lair as we delve into life at the Perth Lynx. The Lynx should be preparing for two games against Adelaide at the Bendat Basketball Centre this week as part of the opening round of the WNBL season. But instead, they're completing an extra month of pre-season training due to our border closures preventing teams from coming in. And they'll start on January 2. Lynx coach Ryan Petrick is on the line. Ryan, thanks for joining us. How have you reacted to the delayed start to your year? Yeah, first off, thanks for having me. Um, and second... It's, uh, it's COVID, so tell us where we're playing, when we're playing, and we'll be ready to go. There's not, uh, there's not much we can do about it. Imports Marina Mabry and Jackie Young have only just completed quarantine. Uh, you look at that and you go, have their late arrivals meant you had a bit of a hint that they were going to delay your season anyway and um, you were able to bring them in a bit later, or were you initially planning on them getting out of quarantine in the past couple of days and still playing this week? Uh, probably neither. Um, the whole thing's been a bit of a mess. Um, as I'm sure the guys would know, the Wildcats side, um, getting imports into the country has been difficult, as obviously the Wildcats would know with their head coach. Um, same deal with us, with Mabry and Young, just trying to get them into Perth with a whole quarantine. And it was just a moving feast every time we thought we had a solution, a new problem turned up. So um, we were trying to get them in as soon as we could. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's been a moving feast with COVID. Uh, and it's just, they're in when they've got in, unfortunately. 
One of the stranger parts of your fixture is it reads like you've got seven weeks on the road, but I believe the WNBL has decided that you'll return to Perth after the match against Melbourne on Feb 6, despite your next game being in Adelaide on Feb 17, and you're a chance to have to quarantine if our borders aren't open. Is that how you're reading it as well? Uh, again, I'll try and leave that with the uh, with people much higher up the food chain than me. Um, we believe we're meant to be home for that, seven, that game on the 17th, I've been told. But again, we've got no idea. We know we certainly might have to quarantine when we get back, but we're hoping and expecting the WA border to be down by then, surely, hopefully. So right now all we know is when our first, second, third, fourth game is, etc., and we'll take it as we go. Are you any chance to get some practice matches in against some players from Western Australia at all, whether it's NBL1 teams, whether it's a mixture of everyone? Um, are you going to get a chance to, to play someone before that round one game? Yeah, 100%. Um, that's the plan. We've got uh, three pre-season games planned currently. Um, and that was one of the big learning exercises from last season. Um, that first game uh, in Townsville against Townsville, where we just got blown out of the water and didn't look like us at all. And then games two, three, four, we settled down and started playing how we thought we would. Um, that's a massive learning experience for us in that we just didn't get enough time in pre-season to play as a team. And hence why the wheels fell off so quickly in game one. So we currently have, you know, like I said, three games planned. Uh, the two next Saturdays against NBL1 women's sides um, in terms of like an all-star select side uh, and then a third game to be announced later on. So let, let's have a look at your roster. Captain Katie Ebsery is retired after a stellar career. Kayla Steindl has moved to Tasmania with her husband Clint as he captains the Jack Jumpers. Um, Jesse Edwards, Nasea Parker Williams, and Jewel Williams weren't recontracted. So into your main roster come Lauren Scherf, Marina Mabry, and Jackie Young, as we've already mentioned. Uh, your four DPs are going to be Mackenzie Clinch Hoycard, along with Emma Gandini. Mia Sadie and Mia Jacobs. And when you combine them with Darcy Garbin, Alex Sharp, Alex Gibatoni, Ash Isenbarger, Taya Burrows and Emma Clark from last season, it looks like an immense amount of talent. You must be really excited about that. Yeah, I mean, we clearly, we needed to address some of the issues we had with uh, the team from last season. And in fairness to last season's team, last season's team was built to play a regular season, not a short wham-bam five-week season, obviously being so young. And then, in fairness, the last year's team as well, we lost two starters before we even started. So, touch wood, that team gets on the floor together this time. Um, but, yeah, we think we've got a little bit older, a little bit wiser, um, have kept some continuity in the roster, which is really, really important in this league. Um, and then I've obviously added some more scoring punch, which is something we lacked last season. Talk to us about uh, the three big arrivals specifically. Marina Mabry, 25-year-old guard from Dallas Wings, who was the WNBA, one of the, the most improved players in the WNBA. She polled votes in that award this season. Talk to us about her. Marina, sorry? Marina, yes. You, you cut out. Yeah, so obviously Marina chasing that Sam Whitcomb piece, um, as we spoke about when we first signed her. Um, just adding more scoring punch and more outside play. Um, she reminds me so much of Sam in 2013 out of Germany. Um, it's not funny. Clearly out of a better league than where Sam was at the time, but their mannerisms, the way they go about it, it's their white line fever, so to speak, once they get on the court. Um, there's so much similarity between the two of them. Um, and just needed more outside shooting uh, from memory. We led the league last season in three-point attempts and finished eighth in field three-point percentage. Um, so we really liked the style we played. Um, just didn't have enough players that could make knockdown shots. And certainly Marina is someone that gives us an extra layer of that, as well as some real gravity to pull her defender away um, and open up more driving lanes for others. Jackie Young is a former number one draft pick in the WNBA and a three by three Olympic gold medalist. What's uh, she going to bring to this team? Uh, and again, another elite talent. Um, Again, played with Marina in college, so they know each other really well. Uh, and their games are different yet suited to playing alongside each other, as they've had success at the college level. Obviously, they won the NCAA championship playing alongside one another. So, again, normally when you bring in two imports, they've never met each other. So the fact her and Marina have played together gives us a massive leg up from the start. Um, again, different style to Marina in that much more lives in the mid-range can get ahead on the rim, um, similar to Courtney Williams style, where Courtney Williams could shoot the three if she had to, but it was much, much more comfortable in the mid-range. Jackie's pretty similar in that regard. 
And then obviously defensively, like she can, again, she can just do a bit of everything. She's long, she's athletic, she can rebound. Um, she's got some flexibility you know, defensively with her defensive versatility. Uh, I mean, there's a reason why she was a number one pick. She is not really an obvious flaw with her as much as she can literally do a little bit of everything that we need. And Lauren Scherf, the WNBL championship winning centre who recently represented Australia at the Asia Cup. Uh, you haven't been the tallest team in the past. It'll be nice to have someone of her height and power. Oh, absolutely. Um, clearly, we would love to have kept uh, Kayla Steindl, but obviously moved to Tasmania with her husband. Um, so needed a new five man. Uh, so to speak. And yeah, Lauren was the one name on the board we really wanted and went after pretty hard, um, especially with that style we played last season defensively. Um, we think she'll give us some real rim protection, uh, just like Kayla did last year. But also her offensive ability to space the floor. She was a real pain in our backside guarding her last season because she could both shoot it from the three at 40%, but then would also go down low and destroy teams inside. And is that modern day big where, as I said, she can shoot the three and back you down and post you up. So putting a true five alongside Darcy, who can play both inside and out, should just add to that flexibility that both Garvin and Mabry and Young already provide. Now, I'm sure you've heard people, your fans, a lot of people in Perth saying, you've still got a spot in your roster. Sammy Whitcomb is a superstar, and she's back living in Perth at the moment, but she's also contracted to be playing in France. People want to know, what is the situation with her? Uh, can you see her being part of the roster, or will she be going back to France? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't want to lie to you, so the less I say, the better, for obvious reasons. Um, Clearly, there's. If you wouldn't take a, you wouldn't need a detective's license to find some obvious truths there. In that, well, one, she signed in France. Two, she's currently not in France, and three, she's currently in Perth. So um, you can find those things out. Spending one minute on social media. Um, obviously, whatever's happening there is happening. Um, the less I say, the better, because it's way above my pay grade. Um, we've known about this for a, a long while now, and have kept it really quiet. And, People have started finding out about it in the last three or four weeks and people have been letting me know and that's terrific. But yeah, we've known about it for a while. Um, if it plays out and Sam um, doesn't go to France and stays, clearly we'd love to talk to her. But right now, she's a French player and we need to leave it at that until that time changes. Did you go to her son's birthday party the other day? <laughs> or did you make sure that you, were you leaving her alone? That You're good friends, obviously, you know her very well. Yeah, I've, we've known each other for nine years now, so we've been in constant dialogue. I try and leave the players alone as much as possible on their days off, um, especially that kind of stuff. She's come home to just be with family. So, again, try to let her spend as much time with family as she can. Um, but, yeah, we've been in contact daily and weekly for months now while this has been going on in the background. And when it plays out, we'll make sure we let you know. Alex Sharp, someone who you um, had on your roster for the first time last year. She's gone on and become an NBL 1 West Grand Final MVP and NBL 1 West MVP of the entire season and played for Australia. Um, you identified her really early. What sh can she be this year? Yeah, well, again, she just she was a girl that ticked multiple boxes. That um, And we'd been lucky in that we coached against her in 2015 in the under 20s and loved her game. Um, and four years later, she came out of college. Um, we were really keen to make a move on her. Um, she gives us a lot of versatility in our style. Obviously, she can play a small ball four, so to speak, because she has a really good size for a guard at six foot one and is a great rebounder as well at that position. But she's a natural three at international level. Um, so she's got some versatility. We can play small ball lineups with her at the four. We can play tall lineups with her at the two or the three. Um, and again, has those two elite skills that she can space the floor and make knockdown shots from the perimeter. But she can also go and rebound, and she rebounds like a big. So she gives us some real big versatility, which, again, modern-day basketball, the more versatile players you've got, the better. This is a really talented squad when you, when you look at it on paper. What are your personal expectations for what this team can achieve? Uh, yeah, again, I don't want to get trapped um, into saying too much just because, again, as we said before, we love the team we had last year and we lost two starters before we even started. So in the modern world of COVID, and as you alluded to earlier with Sam being in Perth, um, we just want to get our starting five on the court in game one, whatever that looks like, uh, and then kind of go from there. Clearly, 
we know in theory the sky's the limit with the girls we've brought in in Mabry and Young and and Lauren Scherf. So we know we've got a really good roster, but we had that last year as well and lost 40% of our starting five before day one. So at this point, um, especially with COVID and things changing constantly, we just want to play a game with our best lineup and see what happens from there. Um, if we can get this roster on the court for a lengthy chunk of the season, then first and foremost, finding a way to keep our head above water um, in this first month and a half on the road. Um, we need to find a way to get back to Perth um, with more wins and losses and then really try and cash in on the home games we have later in the season and then hopefully touch wood go into finals from there. So you didn't play a single game at home last year. You're in the Queensland hub. You're starting this season away again, but you've got a meet and greet for your fans on December 10, so you can finally see them all face-to-face. What will that night mean for you all? Uh, That'll mean a lot. Um, Playing a home game in front of them will mean even more. Um, It's just been a long time for seven seven clubs that haven't seen their home fans in 18 months. it just it sucks, and there's obviously an obvious reason why it's happened because of COVID. So we all get it, but at the same time, it's really hard. And we've had a lot of really good support from back in Perth um, when we're in the hub. And again, this same as this season, like our fans just want to see us play, um, especially with the players we've got. Um, but they've always been really supportive of women's basketball in the state. Um, and it's also such a home court advantage, as the guys would know, the Wildcats. Um, Trying to have these teams go to Adelaide then roll into Perth on a Sunday afternoon. The Perth, every team's got a big home court advantage, but we think ours is huge, and we just haven't seen it for 18 months. So really looking forward to the meet and greet, obviously, uh, on that Friday, but then really, really looking forward to actually playing a home game in front of our home fans. And just finally, we've got a segment on the Dribble podcast called This or That. You have to make an actual decision about... Would you rather this or would you rather that? And what well, the question for this week is, what's better for players? A fixture with extended time at home followed by extended time on the road, a bit like what you're going to have this year, or a home and away schedule where you play two games in the weekend in different states, one at home, one away. If you had the choice of staying in your state for an extended period and then being away for an extended period or traditional home and away, what do you think players benefit more from? Oh, you probably ask the worst person in the world to ask what the players would want. Um, what would you want then? A, oh, uh, it's just a traditional season. That would probably be my one thing right now. It's just traditional 10 home games, 11 away games, or vice versa. Obviously, we play a 21-game season, but it's close to 50-50 as you could. And just uh, a set fixture. <laughs> like right now, you just kind of want some simple things in life, um, which are obviously hard to accommodate with COVID. But just normally you would get a season – published in a season fixture published in June, July, and that wouldn't change until the season finished in March, April. And as you said before, like our fixture for the season hasn't officially been announced yet. And we start in theory this, this weekend. So um, just the normality is what we're chasing more than anything else but for obvious reasons. That's not possible right now. I think everyone on the planet would love the world to go back to normal sooner rather than later. Well, thanks for your time. I know you've literally got to walk straight from this interview into a session with the team, so we appreciate you taking the call. We look forward to hopefully uh, being able to see you all performing at the Bendak Basketball Centre really, really soon, even though we know we know it's not going to be the case. And we do look forward to seeing you on court in some way and hope that the Lynx have a fantastic season. I no, appreciate it, Craig. Thanks for all your time, mate. Well, that's it for the Dribble Podcast this week. Thank you to Danny Mills for coming in from the Perth Wildcats and to Perth Lynx coach Ryan Petrick for jumping on the line. Keep checking the west.com.au every day for heaps of basketball news. Pick up your copy of the West Australian every day and make sure to look out for the STM magazine in the Sunday Times for our story on Scott Morrison. We'll be back next week with more from the Dribble Podcast. Woo!